Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity Reformed Church. Our call to worship is the 95th Psalm, a psalm that was written to encourage worship, to invite to worship. It reads, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is the great God, and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Come. Let's worship our Lord. I'd like to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 1 through 19, and you'll see that that is the entire chapter 3 of Hebrews. Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 19. Listen. Listen. For God's word. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all the house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house than the house for every house is built by someone but he who built all things is God and Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward but Christ as a son over the house over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while well, it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Well, it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned? whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Here is the reading of God's word. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here to open your word, to understand your will, your message. Father, we praise you for having your word, your revealed will. Lord, we ask that our hearts would truly be open to you. Lord, that you would keep my lips from error, for Lord, you are our God, our 
king. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 3 is a unified message. It begins with verses 1 through 6 showing the parallel faithfulness of Moses and Jesus, urging the believer to hold fast to their faith in Christ. It then moves on to give historical evidence of the unbelief of the nation of Israel in the wilderness, quoting from the 95th Psalm in verses 7 through 11. It then exhorts the audience of this letter in verses 12 through 15 not to harden their hearts against God. And then lastly, in verses 16 through 19, centers upon the unbelief of the Jews in the wilderness once more as the example not to follow. The apex of this chapter comes in verse 12 and is really part of the central message of the letter to the Hebrews. It says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The author of Hebrews is writing this letter to encourage these Jewish Christians to stay on the right track. Because placing oneself under the law, under Moses, is departing from the living God. The Jews lifted up Moses, sometimes above the angels. But that was folly. They made Moses a god in a way. But doing so, putting yourself under the law is denying the will of God and thinking that one can be self-righteous. That's something that just can't be done. The author's goal in writing this is to encourage these Jewish Christians and keep them as faithful members of the house of God through faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 1, there are two titles that are used in reference to Jesus. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. And an apostle is someone who is commissioned to perform a task. They not only have a message, they've got authority and power to carry it out. It's more than just a herald that announces something. You can think of John the Baptist being the herald of the Christ. Christ is our apostle, coming with not only a message, but a mission, with the authority and power to carry it out. Jesus was commissioned to be the apostle of our confession. The title apostle refers back to Hebrews ver or chapter 1, verse 2, where it reads that God in these days has spoken to us by his Son. For it was Jesus who brought the good news of salvation to the people. And he also is the high priest of our confession. And this refers back to chapter 2 and verse 17 and making propitiation for the sins of the people, shedding his own blood for the remission of our sins. This title is never used. The title of high priest is never used to refer to Moses. And it places Jesus on another level, above Moses in this regard. And as I stated last week, Jesus acted as our high priest by sacrificing his own life, carrying his blood to the heavenly altar to pay the price for <coughs> your sins. As we look at these first six verses in this chapter, one thing that should be noted is that Jesus is not being contrasted so much against Moses as being paralleled with Moses. The author is showing that both Jesus and Moses were faithful. The faith of Moses and Jesus is shown parallel to each other. Notice that Christ was faithful to him who appointed him. That is, Jesus was faithful to God, his heavenly Father, just as Moses was faithful in all the house of Israel. Meaning that he was wholly faithful, more faithful than anyone 
else of God's chosen people. And that includes David as well, a man after God's own heart. In a sense, their faiths are equated. And in another sense, their faithfulness is shown to be completely different. What the author is doing is showing the reader that even though Moses was deserving of great esteem, and honor for his faithfulness to God, the faithfulness of Jesus is deserving of more honor. And this is so because there's a great difference between the person of Jesus and the person of Moses. And what's that difference? It's the difference between a servant and a son. In other words, where the faithfulness might be equal, it's the relationship to God, the Father, that makes the difference. So we have Moses, who was faithful in all the house of Israel. But then the author shows that the one who builds the house is deserving of much more honor than the house. Which includes anyone who's in the house. The church is the house of God. Moses is a part of that house. And the builder of the house of God is God, because God is the builder of all things. There's nothing that is built without God's hand within it. It is God who creates this universe. It's God who <coughs> creates this earth. And it is God who calls his people to his church. And then we get to the point, Moses was faithful as a servant, a rather unique kind of servant at that, but a servant nonetheless. Christ is faithful as a son. Oftentimes when we see the word servant in the text, it means slave. And a slave is one who is not allowed to have his own will. When the Bible reads, no one can serve two masters, what it's saying is no one can be a slave to two masters. That's not how it works. You're a slave to one master or the other. But the term that is used for Moses does not mean slave. It's a completely different term. And it means a free servant or a willing accomplice. It can be used to mean a squire or a henchman as well. And this is the only time that this particular word is used as for a servant in the New Testament. It's only used of Moses. It's saying that Moses was a willing servant of God. It's saying that he, of all the house of God, chose to serve him. It gives him a very unique standing when compared to the rest of God's people. But when all is said and done, he is still a servant. Willing or not. Able to choose his own way in some respects. And he is in the house of God. If we're part of the house of God. He is inside the house. But Jesus, the Son of God, as the Son is over the house of God. He rules over the house. In other words, he is in charge of the house of God, whereas Moses served in the house of God. You can think of Joseph and Pharaoh in this instance. Now, Joseph had all the authority of Pharaoh. The only one that could countermand his orders was Pharaoh, but he was still a servant of Pharaoh. He was still within the house of Egypt, if you will. And Pharaoh could change his mind. He was a servant of Pharaoh. <clears throat> Moses was a wonderful servant of God. A trusted and exalted servant, for sure, but nonetheless a servant. That is the difference in their stature. Moses serves the father as well as the son of the household. And it is the people of God who are the house of God. It is they that must hold fast to the end. And this is where we meet a challenge in translation. In verse 6 where it reads, If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. It's really not 
the best or smoothest translation into the English language. I don't know about you, but it feels awkward when I try to say it even. The word translated, the rejoicing, means the cause of your boasting. And you can see where somebody would get rejoicing from that, but it's the cause of that rejoicing. It's the act of taking pride in something. You know, we often think of pride as being simple, and nine times out of ten, it is. But to have pride in Christ, pride in knowing Christ, pride in being saved, having joy in that salvation is another thing altogether, and that's what this is talking about. Now, the English Standard Version translates, this, translates the same phrase as, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Now, the NIV reads, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Both of which make the idea of this passage clearer. The idea that is written down here is akin to the believer being so excited about the hope that they have in Christ Jesus, so excited about the life that they've been given, that they find themselves overflowing, boasting of it, because they're so filled with joy. And you can think of a brand new believer. You ever met somebody who just, I mean, they have just been convicted. They're so excited about their faith. They're even excited about the sins they've left behind, and they can't stop talking about it. That's the joy that we should have in Christ every day. This isn't a boasting out of sinful pride, but a boasting out of joy because of the wonderful hope that you have because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the grace of God and your salvation. We're to hold fast to Christ Jesus with confidence and joyful boasting in him, our hope, until the end. You can even think of the martyrs. Who died rejoicing. There were a number of martyrs who died quoting scripture, singing hymns. Even Stephen was looking to God as he died, rejoicing. And from this point on, the author of Hebrews goes straight into a quotation from Psalm 95 in verses 7 through 11 of the passage. Interestingly enough, these correspond to verses 7 through 11 of the psalm as well. So we've seen a comparison of Moses and Jesus in the first six verses. And the truth that Jesus is the hope that we all must hold on to. For Jesus is worthy of much greater honor than Moses. In the Jewish temple worship... Psalm 95 was called a psalm of invitation. It was used to invite the congregation to worship as a call to worship. God, the Holy Spirit, is saying, Today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your hearts as in a rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness. There is something important that we miss here in English where we read rebellion and trial, it's actually referring to place names that are used. Those are Masa and Mirabah. Masa is the word for testing or trial. Mirabah is the word for quarreling or rebellion. I'm sure they may sound familiar to you. Masa is the place early in the wilderness journey where God told Moses to strike the rock of the complaints of the people. He did. And water gushed forth from the rock. Mirabah signifies the place near the end of the wilderness journey where the people again became thirsty and quarreled, complained, and Moses lost his temper and struck the rock rather than speaking to the rock as God had commanded. Masa and mirror of rebellion and the tribe. And Moses lost his place as the leader of Israel. He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land because of what he had 
done, not following the will of God in that instance. And Moses named the place Meribah. This psalm relates the story of those who journeyed through the wilderness and were not allowed to enter into the promised land all because of their disobedience. It is a history of unbelief, a history of a people that wanted to go back to Egypt rather than be led by God himself in the wilderness. They made a golden calf and said it appeared out of the flames. They were witnesses to the mighty acts of God, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of the Egyptian army. They were fed by manna in the wilderness. They were led by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. The presence of God was there. He satisfied their hunger and their thirst. He made sure that their shoes and clothing didn't wear out, and yet they were unfaithful. And God was angry. And so he swore in his wrath, they shall not enter my rest. The reference to Masa and Mirabah would not be missed by any Jew. And for 40 years, that generation slowly passed away. They died off as the journey went on and on, waiting for the last one to drop. And then we get to verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be any or in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's the message, my friend. Don't be like the Israelites in the wilderness and forsake your God. Beware of the pitfalls and encourage one another. <clears throat> Look at the connection between verse 6 and verse 12. You are Christ's house if you hold fast to the confidence and the hope that causes you to boast firmly to the end. Beware of lest any of you have an evil heart of unbelief that is departing from the will of God. It almost makes that psalm a parenthetical statement if you look at it that way, but one that is very appropriate for the conversation. The, this chapter is a reminder of the stubborn nature of the Israelites who are called a thick-necked people. And as an extension, it's a reminder of the rebellious nature of all men. Because Israel is a mirror to the world. But readers must encourage one another to continually look to Christ Jesus. Forget about trying to follow Moses and the law. Look to Christ your Savior because turning your back on Christ is unbelief. It's turning your back on God and turning your back on the salvation that is offered in Christ to all men. Something we talked about last week, that all men can be saved through the sacrifice of Christ. He died for all men. Sadly, there are stiff-necked people that won't follow Christ. And so he has to call his people to him, one by one, name by name. He has to bring them to him. And yes, it's part of the eternal decrees of God. But it is a decree of God. It's not the will of man. So today, the wilderness journey and all of its ramifications, the unbelief, the wrath of God must serve as a warning to Christians today. A warning to everyone sitting in a pew, watching a sermon, worshiping God. Every Christian must examine themselves as well as his brothers and sisters to see if any of them have a sinful and unbelieving heart. A heart 
made hard and closed off from God. This isn't a warrant to be nitpicky and nosy. We've all heard about plucking the log out of your own eye before taking the speck out of your brother's eye. This is speaking about church discipline. That's church teaching. That's what discipline is. Making disciples, teaching them the proper way, encouraging them, grace-filled urging of one another. This is about asking a question of your brother in a situation that warrants it so that you can help them back onto the path if needed. It's done out of love. Paul writes about this in Colossians, and this is what it says in chapter 3, starting in verse 12, going through 17. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word exhort is not, you know, incorrect. It's just <coughs> one aspect of an idea. Exhortation is usually a one-way street. It's telling people the right way that they must go. There's nothing wrong with that. It's strongly urging someone to do something. But to encourage is also an aspect of this same thing, this same word. To tell one another, you're on the right track. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Keep looking at Christ. Don't turn aside. Focus. Keep living your life for Christ. Keep holding on to that hope that is within you. Keep overflowing with the joy of your salvation, for you are Christ if you believe in him. If you believe in him, then live in and for him. And with this exhortation, the author is back to Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And he goes on to reiterate how it was that all those who came out of Egypt rebelled. And it was those same ones, those same people who sinned and raised the wrath of God against them, and they died in the wilderness. They died in unbelief. The journey in the wilderness was 40 years to make sure that none of them got in to the rest of God, to the promised land. And so we see that it is because of disobedience that they were not allowed to enter into this rest. And we also see that they could not enter into that rest because of unbelief, a lack of faith, a lack of trust. What this all means is that there are those that are found within the church, within the people of God, that do not believe. Or there are those that may be teetering toward turning away. Your job, your, your duty is to encourage them with a loving and graceful heart. And we talk about the Great Commission. Going out and making disciples. And it ends with teach them all the things I've commanded. That's an ongoing process. There are those that think it's like, oh, I gave them the gospel, they believe, we're done. It's a lifetime effort. It goes on and on and should be done through love and grace. We need to remind our brothers and sisters of the cause of their hope, the cause of your joy, the 
cause of your boasting, the thing that they should be boasting of as well. And that is salvation through your Lord, Jesus Christ. Take joy into your hearts, my friends. Boast in Christ the Lord. Those who are saved are those who continually, without fail, profess their faith in Jesus Christ. It is faith, and faith alone, that brings you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is faith alone that keeps you in that relationship. Because without faith, you're lost. Your life stands forfeit. Without faith, your life cannot please God. The only way that we can have confidence in life and salvation is to cling to Christ. The foundation of your life must be faith in Jesus Christ. As long as you have that foundation, you're safe and a member of God's house. Always remember that this passage is talking about the folly of disobedience. It's much more than not obeying the will of God. We all fall flat in that area at times. We all sin. This is talking about refusing to obey the will of God. It's a willful act. The Israelites committed a willful act of rebellion against God. They willfully rebelled in unbelief. And think about, think about seeing God part the sea. Think about seeing all those plagues. Think about being led by a pillar of fire and still saying, I don't believe in God. That's what they did. They're like, no way, God. They had no faith. And that lack of faith was manifested in that disobedience. The will of God is to provide rest for his people. To dis disobey God, to lack faith in God, denies God the glory and the honor that he is due. And be, by denying him this glory and honor, he then denies that rebel entrance into his rest, into life. There are enemies at the gates of God's house. But he's not going to let them in. He's not going to let them into his house. And that's where life abides. There are those that deliberately decide to follow their own will rather than the will of God. They choose to follow their own desires. And these desires come from a heart that is hardened and evil and unable to listen to the word of God. And there are those who enter into his rest because they listened to the voice of their Lord and Creator. They looked to him in faith, with trust and belief. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Because hardening your hearts leads to a death in the wilderness. It leads to a death in response to the wrath of God. Come to Christ Jesus, the Son of God, and enter into the house that he built. Believe. And enter into his rest. Be faithful in his house. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we are yours. We praise you for your call. We praise you for building your church through the efforts of your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you for your servant, Moses. We praise you for the life that you give. Gracious Lord, 
We pray as we go out today that our hearts would remain open to your will, to your word, that we would live entirely for you. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen. Go out to love and serve the Lord. Thank <laughs> you.